Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Shokeb Arif and I will be your host today. I would like to welcome all of you on behalf of Al Morid US and Canada. Thank you for attending this webinar. For those of us who may not be familiar with Dr. Rahim, I will attempt to introduce him to everyone attending today. Dr. Abdullah Rahim is an Associate Fellow of Al Morid Foundation for Islamic Research and Education, a contributor to a number of Islamic websites including Al Morid, Understanding Islam, Monthly Journal of Renaissance, and Studying Islam websites. Dr. Rahim is also the founder of the Exploring Islam website that you see as a background right now, where he publishes his articles and videos of online classes and also answers religious questions. Using this website, you can also book a one-to-one -one online session with him now if you require to discuss a subject live in detail or to consult about a personal matter that relates to religion privately. For a complete bio of Dr. Rahim, please visit his website exploring-islam.com. Today's webinar with Dr. Rahim, as evident by the topic, will be completely dedicated to answering your questions on Islam. Please remember that he will only be able to answer in, in the English language. However, if you would like to ask a question in Urdu, then I will attempt to translate it on your behalf. You can also ask a question in one of two ways. You can use the raise hand feature that you see on your screen next to your name. And once it's your turn, I will turn your mic on and you can ask your question. I will leave the mic on while you, after you ask the question, just in case you have a follow-up question to ask of Dr. Rahim. Once you're satisfied, we will move on to the next person asking the question. You can also ask a question by typing it in the chat box on your screen, and we will ask it on your behalf. Please try to keep your questions brief so we can take as many questions as possible. So without any further delay, we start our Q&A session. I will open uh, with a question of my own, uh, Dr. Rahim, that came up in a discussion recently with a friend. My question is that if someone converts to Islam from another faith, Christian in this case, and has a spouse of many years who is still a Christian, should this person seek a divorce from the, their spouse? What is Islam's directive on this subject? How do the examples from Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his time relate to this person's situation and provide us with guidance? What does Quran say about it, if anything? Is there a def different directive for a husband who converts to Islam versus a wife who converted? If you can answer this, I would really appreciate it. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. La hala wa la wa ta'ala billah. Tabakkalt ala al-hayy al-lazhi la yamut wa alhamdulillah al-lazhi lam yattakad waladam wa lam yakun lahu sharikun fil mulk wa lam yakun lahu waliyum wa lam yakun lahu waliyum wa lam Thank you for this opportunity and I try my best to uh, answer the questions to the best of my abilities. Uh, to address the first question that I received, uh, first of all, I want to make it clear uh, one um, confusion that sometimes people may, may make, and that is um, the regulations that we have in the Quran about marrying of Ahl al-Kitab, people of the book, uh, these regulations are about uh, a Muslim, a, a Muslim man, uh, marrying a, a, a lady from Ahl al-Kitab. We do not have anything in the Quran that tell us what will be the situation if the couple are already married and then one of them become Muslim. So uh, these are two separate issues. We may be able to try understand the second issue based on the first one, but what we really need to appreciate and understand is that we don't have any regulation for this in the Sharia. Whatever you read, about the views of the scholars about this is simply a matter of ijtihad. 
simply a matter of opinion, scholarly opinion, but still a matter of opinion. Also, what makes this even more complicated is that uh, the examples and the uh, cases at the time of the Prophet may not be directly relevant to the case that uh, Brother Shukai just, just raised. The reason is that at the time of the Prophet, obviously, there was some sort of war or at least a very heated debate with the Ahl al-Kitab in Arabia. So the situation was totally different. Islam was still to be established. People were starting to become Muslims. There were lots of problems with Ahl al-Kitab. Uh, and of course, with Mushrikeen as well. So this, the examples there may not be totally relevant to what we see uh, today. So with that introduction then, my answer to your question is that because we don't have any um, um, uh, any specific and explicit regulations in Sharia to say in the situation that you described what should be done. Again, for those of you who may not have paid enough attention, the situation that Brother Shukayev explained was that there is this person who is, uh, who is not Muslim uh, and he, is, he or she is already married. Then he decides to become Muslim. Should he divorce his spouse or her, her spouse? We don't have any definite regulation for this. Therefore, because we don't have any regulation, uh, therefore we cannot say that that is, that is compulsory. We cannot say that the person is obliged uh, to divorce. Uh, my personal view in that situation is that I think family is a very important unit of society. And we all know that um, the, the, the contract of marriage is a very respect the contract and we know that uh, Islam, religion and God has put lots of emphasis on this. If we already have a family and then one person in this family has become Muslim, I personally do not think that it is going to be in line with the values of Islam for this person to, uh, to basically perish this family. Uh, by, 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 by starting the process of divorce with, with his or her spouse. Uh, unless, of course, the, the family is dysfunctional or unless uh, the, 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 the wife or the husband who is still not Muslim himself or, her, or herself or himself has any problem with this. Otherwise, there's no reason to, to think about divorce in this situation. If there's any follow-up question on that, I'm happy to answer. I think this answers uh, uh, in detail what I was looking for. Uh, Basit, uh, there's two chat questions. Can you move on to one? Basit, can you hear me? I'll go ahead and ask. This question is from Abdul Rahim Sayyid. And uh, he's asking, Salam, my question is, why is there no mention of hell in the Old Testament as exclusively as it's in Quran? Okay, so, Abdul Rahim Sayyid, Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullah. First of all, uh, I think you need to ask that question from, from a, a Jewish scholar. Uh, not a student of Islam, uh, but I can just uh, share with you what I think. Um, what we need to understand, uh, two things. Number one, the uh, Quran introduces itself as Muhaymin. Muhaymin means protector. And in the context of the verses that this word is being used, that means that Quran is protector of the uh, scriptures that have been revealed before which means Bible, because that is what we have. And the meaning of Quran being pro protector of these books is that Quran will become criteria to then understand what part of these books are, are fully authentic, what parts might be partially, are partially authentic, and what parts, what information may be missing. Uh, when the Quran tells us that what will happen in the hereafter, then that will become criteria for us. Then based on that, we will go back and look at the Bible. Now, if you look at the New Testament, Injil, 
you do find, in fact, very explicit references of uh, reward and punishment in the hereafter. So we do have it in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, it seems to be up to interpretation. So as far as I know, and in no way I can claim that I'm an expert in the Old Testament, but as far as I know, and as far as I have read about it, uh, there are some, some, some groups of Jews and some uh, scholars of Jews that uh, by looking at these verses and also by looking at some of the other information that they get from Talmuds, uh, they, they do get actually the idea of hereafter and reward and punishment and heaven and hell from it, while of course there are many others who they look at these verses and they do not get that idea from it. Uh, so it, it's it's not really uh, uh, you know we cannot say definitely it's not there. We can say that maybe it's not as explicit as we used to have it in in the Quran. Uh, the, the other point that we need to understand is that let's not forget that the concept of hell and heaven and all those descriptions that we have in the Quran, in the words of the Quran itself. Uh, these are among the mutishabihat. These are the, the, the language there is the language of symbolism. Simply because we cannot understand exactly what will happen to us uh, in the hereafter uh, in, 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 a, in a very tangible and accurate way. Quran has taught in, a, in the best language that we could understand almost what it, what it is going to be uh, look like. Uh, what we know is that there is there is going to be reward and there is going to be punishment. Uh, Allah Ta'ala has chosen uh, to use the description that we see in the Quran uh, today uh, for describing that hell for the people who received this book for the first time, which were Arab of Arabia. Remember, for Arab of Arabia, sun and heat uh, and burning was something that they would feel almost every day. And then for them, being in a shadow and uh, having nice water and uh, a cool area, that was the best thing they could have. And then you can see that the same language is being used in the Quran, that language of symbolism to explain heaven and explain hell. I think if the Quran was revealed, let's say, in Scotland, where we always have water and, and raining, then maybe uh, the description of heaven would be somewhere that you have sunshine rather than somewhere that you have shadow because people they are not looking for shadow, they are looking for sunshine. So what I'm trying to say, brother uh, Abdul Rahim, is that number one, we can, uh, well number one we need to ask a Jewish scholar. Number two, uh, we cannot say by, by definitely that there is no mention of hell. We can say that it is not being mentioned maybe explicitly as we expected. It has been mentioned in the New Testament. And number three, maybe the description uh, is not exactly as we have it in the Quran, but that description is the language of symbolism, symbolism anyway. But the concept of reward and punishment, I think, can be interpreted and can be derived from the verses of the Old Testament. Thank you, Dr. Rahim. Masak uh, here. I wanted to ask you the next question from the chat session. This is from Ajaz Ahmed. And the question is, enlighten us uh, on the ruling of Islamic Sharia about interest with reference to the current financial scenario in the West, especially in the U.S. and Canada, where Muslims are confused and divided on the topic. Most people don't buy home or mortgage because, because of that and putting their family in unnecessary hardship. Thank you. One uh, principle that I encourage all my brothers and sisters uh, consider and do their best to adopt that principle when they are thinking about uh, instructions of, the, of Islam is that the core uh, message of most of these instructions are being given to us in the Quran. We need to first understand what that core message is and what the reason for it is. As Arab says, Maqasidu Sharia. Maqasidu Sharia. The, um, the goals, the intentions of Sharia. Once you understand what the core message is, 
then we will be able to understand every other thing that relates to that subject and then come up with answers to our inquiries. When, we, when you read the verses of the Quran about interest, what you actually find there is that the whole concern is about the victim, the victim of the system in which there is riba, there is interest. And you find that all the criticism is about the person who is receiving interest, who is benefiting from this situation. Based on that, we can then understand that the person to be objected, the person who is in fault, the person who is criminal, is a person who is collecting interest. It is not the person who is paying the interest. The person who is paying the interest, he is the victim. And then as uh, Brother Rejaz himself uh, had it in his question, uh, what we are doing is that at our time and at our age, uh, when we know, and I'm, I'm also in the West, I know, uh, sometimes there's absolutely no way that you can have a comfortable place that a decent human being deserves to have unless you get, let's say, mortgage, uh, and which then means you need to pay interest. Uh, in this situation, then sometimes, out of misunderstanding, we advise to our brothers and sisters that, no, you should not get mortgage. You should not do that. Basically, what we are doing is that we are defeating the whole purpose of this regulation, because the whole purpose was to help the victim. And not, now what we are doing is that the victim himself is okay to be victimized so that he cannot become, he would not become a victim of something even more difficult than that. And then we are telling him that, no, actually, you should be victim of that more difficult thing uh, just to follow that regulation. And this is wrong. Now, when I say that normally, then uh, the follow-up question comes that, well, we do have hadith that says anybody who is involved in riba and he is cursed, etc. What about those hadiths? So two things, and I say that very quickly, and if you need more clarification, let me know. Number one, in some of the hadiths, there is a reference to mu'akkilu riba. And this mu'akkilu riba sometimes is being uh, translated as uh, the one who is uh, giving the interest. Uh, the fact of the matter is that if you look at the Arabic of that, that actually means the person who has become like a facilitator of that riba, the person who facilitates the system of getting the interest, not the person who is actually paying the interest. Also, another thing you, thing you need to consider. Consider the time of the Prophet. Consider the time of the Prophet, and uh, this is not a situation that we are trying to eliminate riba. So the Prophet has instructed everybody that riba needs to be eliminated. And then there is one person there, or a group of people there, who are insisting that, no, 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 we want to get a loan, and we want to pay interest. So they are actually moving against the campaign that is already in place, the campaign that is going to be successful. Well, of course, they are doing something wrong. So yes, if at our time, the situation comes where they say, look, we are trying to eliminate riba, we are trying to eliminate interest, here are some very good options open to all of us, and it is happening. And uh, let's say in a six months time, all the interest will be eliminated, and nobody will need to pay interest anymore. And then in that situation, I say, no, actually, I want to get that loan that I need to pay interest for it. Then yes, in that case, I am helping something that is harm. But unless a situation like that happens, you, you cannot say that if a person uh, pays interest, he is contributing uh, to that haram thing. And being in, in my parallel life, uh, being a bit aware of uh, economy and situation, I can tell you, and I can guarantee for you, that it is almost impossible today to eliminate riba from the, from the globe. It's almost impossible. I, I, I cannot even imagine how something like this can happen, unfortunately. So if, if you need any uh, further explanation on that, please let me know. So just, just to then summarize then, uh, it is the receiving of interest that is haram. 
paying off interest is not haram. Therefore, there is absolutely nothing wrong with taking benefit from facilities like mortgages, like buying a car on the basis of loan, etc., etc., etc. There is absolutely nothing wrong with that. If somebody, out of his own personal preference, decides that he doesn't want to involve in that, then that's fine. But we cannot say that it is haram and you should not be involved in it. Thank you, Dr. Rahim. Uh, the next question is from Mirza Beg Saab. Uh, please go ahead with your question. Assalamu uh, alaikum. My question is related to the, uh, it's kind of a follow-up question to what Shakeba asked. Uh, in your comments, you mentioned that uh, the uh, regulation in the Quran is about men marrying uh, people from people of the book and there's no mention of uh, women about it but what I've heard and what I've understood so far is that women are not allowed to marry uh, outside uh, outside other than anybody outside uh, a Muslim person so can you comment on that Okay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, brother Mirza Baik. Uh, first of all, uh, I, perhaps I wasn't clear enough. Uh, what you said, I, I, uh, I have told, was not exactly what I said. So let me first clarify that. Uh, although it is true that there is no uh, mention of allowance for Muslim women to marry with a non-Muslim, but what I actually said was that the regulation that we have, and that is in Surat Ma'ida, is about a person who wants to become, who wants to marry a non-Muslim. So in that case, that's going to be a Muslim man who wants to marry a lady from Ahl al-Kitab. I said, this is mentioned in the Quran. What I said is not mentioned in the Quran is a situation when this person is already married to somebody from Ahl al-Kitab. He himself is Ahl al-Kitab. Now he becomes Muslim. Should he then divorce his wife or not? That was what I said uh, is not mentioned in the Quran. So that just, just to clarify that. So I presume then perhaps what uh, you brother or, uh, would like to discuss is the question that what about um, a Muslim woman? <clears throat> Can Muslim women marry um, a non-Muslim, a man, a man from Ahlul Kitab or not? Now, first let me make it very clear. Uh, that what the situation is. When you read at the Surah Ma'idah, there is a permission for Muslim men to marry the ladies from Ahl al-Kitab, those of them who are decent uh, women. Uh, Muslim men are allowed to marry them. There is no mention of what about Muslim women. Uh, it doesn't say they, sh they cannot marry, and it doesn't say they can marry. Uh, the interpretation and the understanding of most of the scholars, I can say like something like maybe 98 percent of the scholars, is that what that means is that while Muslim men can marry uh, ladies from Ahl al-Kitab, Muslim women cannot marry men from Ahl al-Kitab simply because the permission is not given in the Quran. Now here is where I need to uh, elaborate a little bit, and here is a bit that becomes tricky, because uh, as Brother Shukait introduced me, I am uh, I'm working with Al Morat Institute. Jawad uh, Ahmed Ramadi Sahib is my teacher, and uh, I, 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 I've learned a lot from him, and I'm still learning from him. Uh, but on this particular subject, I humbly have a different. Uh, understanding from my teacher. So let me explain what Javed Ahmed Ramazi says because I think it is fair to first explain what, what, what his thinking is. I think many people are interested in that. And then very briefly I will tell you what I think. So what Javed Ahmed Ramazi, my teacher, says is that, well, not only women, Muslim women, should not marry uh, non-Muslim men, even for the Muslim men, they should only marry with the Muslim women if they are in a society and in a situation that they are sure that this marriage 
still guarantees a Muslim family and the Muslim generation and basically a Muslim household. And from there, then, uh, this extension of the argument comes that, for example, if you are a Muslim man as a minority in a non-Muslim country, uh, where Muslims are not yet fully established, then perhaps that means that maybe you should not then marry uh, women from Ahl al-Kitab, because being a minority, most probably that will mean that it is going to be you who will, uh, who will uh, give up, uh, not your own Islam, but will give up uh, training your family and your generation to, to remain good Muslims, etc. Now that is uh, my understanding of what my teacher Javed Ahmed Ghamadi says. Uh, very quickly, my own humble opinion, uh, which is different, is that uh, I think uh, what really matters really is that uh, when we marry somebody, whether, it, whether he's or she's Muslim, what I'm saying is both about men and women, okay, so it doesn't matter. So I'm not going to repeat he and she, he and she. Uh, so it's for, for both genders. When we marry somebody, whether she's Muslim or non-Muslim, even if he's Muslim, one criteria should be there. And that criteria is that this marriage should not bring risk to the concept of Tawheed and monotheism uh, taking away from my household. That is what needs to be, we need to be sure about it. If I want to marry even a, even a Muslim woman, and I think that this woman or her family are in a way that if I marry them, uh, the concept of monotheism and Tawheed, the Deen Ibrahimi, the Abrahamic religion, that is not going to be the dominating concept in my life, in my in my household. Then I don't, I, I should not marry that woman, whether Muslim or non-Muslim. And I think what that verse in Surah Al-Maida is referring to is actually that thing. Now the thing is that at the time of the Prophet. Please consider this. We are talking about 1,400 years ago in Arabia. At that time, men were really the most influential members of the society and the family. It was very, very rarely that a man would believe in something and would want to bring something to the household, and then the woman would say, no, I disagree with that. So therefore, it was very clear and very natural that the permission was given for men because uh, it would be guaranteed that if man was Muslim, then he would make the household Muslim, uh, the followers of monotheism anyway. I don't think that situation applies today, in particular in most of the Western countries. Right or wrong, we are seeing that women are as influential as men. I'm seeing around myself many women that their thinking, uh, the way that they preach, the way that they talk is much more influential than many men that I have seen around me. I've seen around myself many families in which it is actually the woman whose thinking is influencing the whole family. So in that situation, I don't see any difference between Muslim men or Muslim women as long as there is no danger that the concept of Tawheed would be jeopardized, would be perished in the household, I don't see any reason that we should stop a Muslim woman to marry a man from Ahl al-Kitab. That is my humble opinion, but as I said, the view of my Ustad is that definitely Muslim women uh, should not marry a man from Ahl al-Kitab, and even men should be very cautious about doing that, they want to make, they need to make sure that uh, uh, Islam will be dominating in the family and monotheism will be dominating in the family. Thank you. Okay, th thank you. The next question is from our chat session and this question is from Saeed Hassan. Uh, Saeed Hassan, um, and the question is, Al-Murid scholars are of the opinion 
that there is only one mode of recitation. Since the Quran is printed and distributed, written identically, then what is the issue of Qira'ah? Um, so, brother, uh, is, is, the, is a question is that uh, is a question about uh, whether the Qira'at is sab the seven? What is the concept of seven Qira'at? Is that the question? I believe I believe that's the question. Uh, it starts. The, it says that since al Morris scholars are of the opinion there's only one mode of recitation or qira that is hmm. final. Okay. Okay, then that's what, why do yeah. Yeah, I think I I think I got the concept. Let me uh, answer this in a way that even if your question, brother said, is slightly different, I still hopefully have answered that. Uh, you see, we have two concepts uh, in the traditional of Islamic scholarship. And these two concepts are number one, uh, the seven uh, the sabah uh, of seven seven wording of the Quran, and number two, the different readings of the Quran. Some people say ten readings of the Quran. Some say seven readings of the Quran. Ten readings seems to be more correct. So we have two concepts here: uh, different wordings of the Quran, different readings of the Quran. Um, I encourage you, brother, to uh, Google it, perhaps, and do a bit of research on this. Uh, if you can read Arabic even better, but even in English, I think you can find many, many, many uh, good articles on this. There is absolutely no agreement among the scholars that what does that even mean, let alone what are the specifications. There is no agreement that what does what exactly seven ahruf means seven ahruf. What exactly these different readings Quran has uh, has different readings. We have hadith that says Quran has uh, is coming in different readings and is in different wording. What exactly that means? How we can see these? What are the examples? There is no agreement on that. And these ahadis and these narrations are on the basis of very, very ahad ahadis. I mean ahadis, the hadith and the narrations that we have received them by only very few individuals. So they are, they are not really very reliable. Uh, my, 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 my very good friend and my colleague, uh, Dr. Shehzad Salim, uh, his PhD is actually, was actually, uh, about this concept, and uh, mashallah, he has put the whole dissertation, his PhD, on Al Morid website. You can actually download it, and he has also written articles about it in the monthly journal of Renaissance. He has looked at these ahadis in detail, and he has shown that none of these ahadis uh, have any degree of reliability. Uh, so there is really no need for this. When we have the Quran here, and I'm, I'm asking you, brother, see. Uh, any any um, normal book that you buy from from the bookshop, yeah. Let's say you buy a, a novel from an author. If the author or if the publisher of that book is responsible enough, he will write somewhere in the introduction of that book that look, this novel has been written in five different ways, or this novel has two different endings. You, want, you may want to read the second uh, proposed ending as well. Or the wording of this novel has been written in 10 different ways. So this one is number three. There are another nine other ways of reading it as well. You do expect to get that information from the author himself or from the publisher. Where in this book it has said that this book has been revealed to you in seven ways or can be read in ten different ways. Don't we think that the same principle should apply here? Na'uzubillah, na'uzubillah, is God not smarter and wiser than the example of that top that I gave you? Of course he is. He is Hakim. Not only we don't have any information here, actually it says here that you are protecting this book for you. Don't you think that when it's the best place to explain these different readings would be in that place, when it says 
inna nahnu nazzalna dhikr wa inna lahu lahafidun we are the ones who is revealing this zikr to you and we are the ones who are protectors of it or in the other place where it says that inna alayna jam'ahu wa qur'ana collecting it and reading it back to you the final version is our responsibility don't you think that would be the place that perhaps God will say and by the way there's going to be 10 readings don't worry about it all of them are authentic or there's going to be seven readings and all of them are authentic we don't have that and what I encourage the uh, brother to uh, encourage your brother to do is to all of these readings are only slightly different there are not that much of difference between them they are very slightly different but still there Sometimes when people try to get rules of Sharia and these things from them, you can see how much confusion has actually come up because of these different readings. The person makes a hook based on the reading of the Quran and then says, well, if, if we go with a different reading, then the hook might be different. Uh, I think Quran is better than that. Uh, and I think that's the reason, that, that, that's, that's how uh, we have come to this understanding that there's absolutely no basis for such a, a terrible claim that puts the authenticity of the Quran uh, and the wisdom of Allah Ta'ala both under question. Thank you very much. Uh, I have another question, Dr. Rahim, uh, that was sent to me along with the registration uh, for this uh, session. And the question, uh, if I understand it correctly, I'll just read it out and, uh, and uh, see what I understood. The question is, the Prophet Muhammad may peace be upon him, is the preeminent of the descendants of Adam on the judgment day. Then where or what position remain the other prophets, especially Prophet Jesus? And this question came from uh, Nido Fant. Um, now, brother, uh, I need you to help me with the English. Sure. Uh, when, when the brother says, or the sister says, preeminent, can you elaborate that for me a bit? I, I believe it says that, uh, you know, um, if Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu is held in high regard among the descendants of uh, Adam al-Islam, then on the judgment day, what is the position for other prophets, especially uh, Prophet Jesus? What um, th this is what I could understand that on the judgment day, uh, where will the other prophets be? What uh, this is the best I can uh, understand from it. Okay, okay, that's fine. Uh, let me answer the question the way that I think it is. Sure. And if you think that I haven't answered it, please do let me know. Um, we all love Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And uh, I think, uh, I'm talking for myself, but I think it's pretty much true for every other Muslim as well. Uh, if, if somebody asks you who among the prophets you want to see, if you had a chance, I think we all will say Prophet Muhammad. However, the, the, the fact is that this idea that Prophet Muhammad was the best of creation and of the best of all the prophets, that is just our own understanding and our own saying. We don't have it in the Quran. See again, uh, this is one of those strange things. We, um, it comes to the things that are directly related to God, and the only thing that we do not consult is actually the book of God itself. Uh, we, we go and ask our teacher, we go and ask uh, the Imam of the mosque, we, are, we go and ask um, um, the storylines, and we go and look at some ahadis. We don't look at the Quran itself. Look at the Quran. Where in the Quran it says that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is the best of the prophets? Where it says? I'm not. I'm not trying to say he is not. What I'm trying to say is that we don't have any proof for that. Okay. I like it to be true as a Muslim, but we don't have any proof for that. In fact, if we need to pick up one 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 prophet. Uh, from the list of prophets, based on the Quran, based on the Quran, if we need to pick up one person and say that by the tone of the Quran, it seems like that person, that prophet, 
is the one that has the highest rank. Let me ask Brother Shokai, which prophet you would choose, Brother Shokai? Which brother, which prophet you would pick? If I ask you, Brother Shokai, that just based on the Quran, if you want to tell me based on the Quran, which prophet seems to be the most important prophet I, in the eyes of God, which one would you choose? I would think uh, Ibrahim al Islam, Abraham al Islam. Exactly, exactly. And I think the same. We have in the Quran, it says to the Prophet that you're following, you're following Ibrahim. In fact, think about it. The coming of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu was answer to the prayer of Ibrahim in Surah Al-Baqarah. It is Ibrahim who prays and says, Oh God, Wab asfihim rasulan. I don't want to read the rest of it because maybe I miss some of the Arabic words, but the English would be that send them a Prophet who would yuzakihim wa yu'allimuhum al-kitab wa al-hikmah. Yu'allimuhum al-kitab wa al-hikmah wa yuzakihim. Teach them the book and the wisdom and purify them. And then God answers to that prayer and we have Prophet Muhammad. Uh, so, again, I don't want to make any misunderstanding. I am not saying that uh, necessarily Prophet Muhammad is not the best of the prophets. All I'm saying is that we don't have any evidence to, to make such a claim. I think what we need to do is what the Quran tells us to do, and that is to not make any difference among them and to respect all of them, uh, and to leave, leave it for God to decide you know, what is the position of every prophet in the hereafter. The uh, next question I have uh, is from Sayyid Hassan, uh, Brother Sayyid Hassan again. And uh, he's asking, the preservation of Hadith has a grave flaw of poor connectivity in citation, and it has affected the faith adversely. Why Ummah has compromised on the quality of Iman thus far? Okay, so again, that's a question that you need to ask Ummah, uh, not me. I am not representing the Ummah here. But let me just explain for you what I think is happening. Uh, and to some extent, you know, uh, Brother Said, uh, we need to understand. We need to understand people. Uh, just think about it this way. Uh, the Prophet has passed, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The first generation that still is there are the generation of companions. Uh, they knew the Prophet, they had seen the Prophet, they, they had heard a lot from the Prophet. So they were satisfied with what they knew from the Prophet. The next generation did not have that privilege, so they actually started asking the companions, please, please, explain for us, how was the Prophet? How did he look like? How did he walk? How did he eat? How did he pray? What were the things that he would say? Has he said anything about prayers? Has he said anything about this? Has he said anything about that? People were curious. They had every right to be curious. And it goes on and on and on, and generation after generation, and people started to think that, you know, we need to write this down. Uh, people have right to, to hear uh, indirectly from the Prophet. So they wrote, wrote it down, and that was Hadith. But unfortunately, in that writing down, like any other thing that is being written down in the, in, 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 in the type in the style of narration, of course there were lots of errors, of course there were lots of mistakes, and of course there was lots of intentional intentional mistakes. All of that was collected, and it is now hadith. And of course, people like it. People do like to read what the prophet has said. So we need to understand where where the Ummah has come from. Uh, very many times, I, I, many times I, I, I just love to uh, open a book of Hadith and, and, and just read some Hadith because I would like to think that what I'm reading, hopefully maybe part of it, maybe the, the saying of the Prophet. I, I do like to read it. But we need to understand the Ummah. Um, what I don't understand, and then Brother Said, maybe you can answer, answer that is that, okay, we do love hadith, but we also should love Quran as well. 
how it is that when we see something in hadith that apparently is opposed to the Quran, is in conflict with the Quran, we choose to put, put, put down the book of the Quran and, and keep up that hadith and then try to justify that verse of the Quran uh, rather than questioning that, that hadith or questioning our understanding of that hadith. That is the problem, brother. So the, the, the problem is not appreciating hadith. We should appreciate hadith. Hadith is a source of knowledge. Even though many of it may be wrong, it is still a good source of knowledge. The problem is not positioning hadith with regard to the Quran in the wrong place, in the right place. If this is the Quran and if this is the hadith, the position should be this. Quran is at the top, hadith is here. The position should not be this, both of them in the same level. Unfortunately, to the mind of many Muslims, the position is actually this. Hadith is even higher than the Quran because they, they, see, they read something from Hadith, they read something from the Quran. Apparently, they are saying something different. They choose to go with the, what they understand from the Hadith and interpret the Quran accordingly while it has to be the other way around. We need to understand the Hadith based on the Quran. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Rahim. Next question is uh, from Abdul Rahim Sayyid again. And the question is, is every rule or suggestion mentioned in the Quran part of Sharia? For example, Quran says that the, that the husband should be the head of the household or family. Is this going to be considered a part of the Sharia? I wouldn't call that as part of Sharia. Uh, the Quran uh, in that case is actually referring to a concept. It is referring to a um, premise. It is referring to a principle. Uh, it is only after appreciating that principle that then some rules of Sharia will make sense for us. Like the right of divorce uh, that is given to the husband. Yeah. So if somebody says, why the right of divorce is given to the husband? Of course, we do know that if the wife wants to get divorced, she can still do that. But she needs to do that indirectly. She needs to go to the court, for instance, and do that. But the husband, um, in principle, can just announce divorce. Why? Then the reason is in the Quran, the premise on the basis of which this ruling is there is in the Quran, and that is what you refer to, Ar-Rijal Awamuna al nisa which I think is best, uh, we can best translate it as men are, are like guardians of women. Uh, it doesn't mean men are bosses of women, or men are, are, are the head of women, or something like that. They're, they're guardians, and it says what the reasons are. So, no, that example that you uh, gave me, I wouldn't call it Sharia. Sharia uh, normally is about a ruling, a ruling that has practical, practical, direct practical implementation. It's not a concept. It's not a, uh, it's not a principle. It's a ruling. So it has to be a ruling so that we can then call it Sharia. How about his general question that is every rule suggestion mentioned in the Quran part of Sharia? I guess by extension of what you said, that would not be the case. And I would like to hear an example of a rule that you would then ask me, is that part of Sharia? And then I answer that. Um, I think that's a better way of doing it. But let me just uh, say something uh, different here that may still be valid, and that is um, Every rule in the Quran uh, has a reason, and in most cases, we do we do know what the real, what what the reason is. Uh, if that reason is no longer relevant, then that ruling can be adapted, can be revised. Uh, that I can say. Uh, I'm not going to go to any example just now because it may. Uh, extend my, my talk. I would like to answer more questions, but uh, just take it from me, my understanding, that uh, 
if we know what the reason of a ruling is and if following that rule will not satisfy that reason, then that ruling need, will need to be revised uh, and, and, and need, will need to be studied and perhaps adapted rather than 100% uh, just copying that rule. Uh, again, it is not really relevant, but just to make sure that there is no misunderstanding there as well. Uh, in the verse of Surah Al-Nizhar, Rijal Qawwamun Ala Nisa, you know that after that it talks about uh, beating women. That very controversial verse that many people criticize, etc. I have an article about it, I've elaborated on it, on the Exploring Islam website that if you want you can look at it. That, for instance, is not part of Sharia. You cannot say that the Sharia of Islam says that if, you have, if, your, if your wife disobeys you, then do this and do that and then beat her up. That is not part of Sharia. Uh, that is simply uh, an advice, a suggestion that the Quran has. And the best way that you can understand why it is not part of Sharia, or why we say it is not part, not part of Sharia, is that if, if a husband decides not to do that, no one says he has committed a crime. No one says he has committed a sin. If, if a husband has the most disobeyed wife, the most disobeying wife, but he still, you know, decides to be patient and to behave normal and not to do anything about it. No scholar of Islam says he is doing something haram because he's not doing those three steps. Why? Because these are not part of Sharia. Thank you, Dr. Aim. Uh the next question I have is from Mirza Beg. He's asking, is your opinion about Zabiha the same as Gamadi Sab? Uh, um, I was hoping that no one will ask that question from me. Uh, the, the reason is that uh, at the moment, my answer is yes. At the moment, my, my opinion is uh, is the same. Uh, however, uh, I have started to develop uh, some second thoughts on this. And actually, these exact days, I am doing a bit of more studying and research on this subject. Uh, and I'm not sure where this, where this research will take me. Uh, it may take me to a different view. Uh, but at the moment, Yes, my view is the view of uh, Javed Ahmed Ali. Uh, one view that I found it interesting, and I, 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 I cannot still say that it is convincing for me, I, I can only say it is interesting, is actually a very old view, and that belongs to Imam Shafi'i. Uh, Imam Shafi'i, uh, he was of the opinion, as has been reported from his students, that uh, when you look at the verses of the Quran, you find that really the main problem of zip was when you do zip and say the name of idols. And only in one or two places in the Quran, it says that uh, when you don't eat from something, that name of God has not been announced on it. The opinion of Imam Shafi was that even in those places, if we look at the context, the real issue was the issue of shirk, not the issue of saying the name of God. It seems like his view was that at that time, when people were not saying the name of God, that was because they were actually saying the name of idols. So when the verse says, do not eat from something that name of God has not been mentioned on it, actually in built in it, it was don't eat from something that name of other God has been mentioned on it. I found that argument interesting. But as I said, I'm still doing research. Uh, and once I get to conclusion, which is going to be actually very soon, maybe in a couple of weeks time, then I will try to share my views with, with my friends. Uh, but at the moment, yes, I do share the view of my Ustaz, Kalmati, uh, which is the name of the the name of God should be mentioned, otherwise we cannot eat from the Zabiha. If I can, uh, this is Shukhe if, if I can ask a follow-up question to Beg Sahib's question. Uh, what about 
uh, what does Imam Shafi say about Ramji Sahib's position when he says that you have to take name of Allah because it is essentially a permission to take a life that you're on those lines, I mean, is, has Imam Shafi addressed that point? Um, I, I don't think Imam Shafi has addressed that point, but I also uh, would like to say that uh, at the same time, we don't have any uh, evidence in the Sharia itself that says this was the reason. So that is the reason that uh, uh, Ahmadi Sahak uh, considers for this ruling, which is a very nice reasoning actually. It's, it's very nice to think that, you know, if you want to, um, you know, take away the life of an animal for your, uh, for your food, uh, then you need to have permission of God. Um, but what I'm saying is that Imam Shafi did not have to address that, that argument because that is only a personal opinion. We don't have anything in, in any the Sharia, a part of Sharia or any reliable hadith to say this was the reason. So Imam Shafi, perhaps it never occurred to him. Thank you. Thank you. So the next question is from Fasi uh, M. I only have the in first letter of the last name. And it, it's, it goes something like this, uh, and it has a quote from the Quran that reads, Surely the worst of animals in Allah's sight are the deaf the dumb who do not use their brains, end quote. Can you shed some light to interpret this ayat? Does this in any way indicate that we should research, open our minds and try to understand this or seek advice from people like you who have already researched? Uh, what name of the brother was Fasi? Uh, it's F-A-S-I, so I, I, I suppose it might be Fasi. Please okay. correct us if you're online right now. Well, that's fine. I just want to say what 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 a what a beautiful name, Fasih. Uh, if that, if it is Fasih uh, as as we have it in in in, in Arabic, uh, which is this. Uh, can you see it? Uh, no. But anyway, yeah. uh, then then that means one whose wording is eloquent and and effective. But anyway, uh, yes. Brother, I think you have actually interpreted the verse very nicely. Uh, one of our problems is that we read these verses of the Quran about uh, kuffar and things like that, and then we just say that, oh, you know, poor, poor, terrible people. And it has nothing to do with us, of course, because we are alhamdulillah Muslims, so we are okay. Uh, the thing is that uh, Quran is emphasizing on attitudes. It is not emphasizing on labels. When it talks about the concept of kufr and kafir, then Quran explains what kafir means. And in the explanation of the Quran, a kafir means somebody who has put his, you know, uh, he, he's not he listening to anything. He has decided that what he's, he knows is the best. And he has decided that no matter what, he's not going to change his opinion. If he thinks that it is, it, is, it is night, even if you put him in front of the sun, he will still say, no, nope, it is night. That is kafir. Somebody who has chosen, due to arrogance, not to listen carefully and not to be open-minded. And I'm always thinking that we Muslims, actually, are very, very fortunate and very, very lucky. You know what? Because if we were at the time of the Prophet, with this same attitude that today we have, I think we would end up in the wrong side of the war in the Battle of Badr. Because we are doing exactly what they are doing. They were saying that we have just heard this from our generations after generations. We are not going to change it. We are almost doing the same thing. We do not we do not allow ourselves to think. We are just happy to follow whatever we have heard from, from the last generation, no matter what. And that is this exact uh, mistake that Christians did, Jews did, and we know from hadith of the Prophet that we are following exactly the same mistakes that they have done. 
So yes, brother, uh, mashallah, you had a very good interpretation. Uh, we need to learn, we need to learn to learn, to be students. Uh, um, we need to learn to open our ears. We need to learn that when somebody asks us question, from that very first moment that we are hearing the question, we should not start thinking what answer I'm going to give him. No, 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 we should start to think maybe this guy has a point. Really, really absorbing the question, digesting it, understanding it. And only if we think that, okay, I have different view there, then we would share it with him. We need to hmm. learn that when we discuss with others, we do not discuss with the purpose of um, winning the debate and convincing the person, but we discuss for the purpose of giving the person an opportunity to hear our views and giving ourselves an opportunity to hear the person's views mm -hmm. and then decide what to do. Let me tell you something, you might find this interesting. Uh, there's this, um, there's this uh, report in the history uh, that once in, in a mosque at the time of Bani Abbas and at the time of Ma'mun, the Khalifa of Bani Abbas, uh, a person who was atheist, I think his name was Ibn Abil Awja, uh, he was debating with a Muslim scholar questioning the concept of God. Uh, what I found interesting in this story was that the debate took place in the Masjidul Jami' in Medina. In the Masjidul Jami', the major mosque in Medina. At the day of Friday, on the day of Friday, after the Friday prayer. So just imagine that. It is Friday prayer in Masjidul Jami', in the heart of the empire of Islam. And then this Itis goes there and he waits for prayer to be done and then he goes in front and he shouts actually, you can read it in the report, he shouts, O oh, Imam of the Mosque. Now, actually what he says is this, he says that I do not believe in God and I think there is no God. Is there anyone among you who can argue with me? What do you think happened? <laughs> they killed him? No! They sat down. One of the scholars sat down with him and started debate with him. And the scholar lost the debate. He was he just happened not to be in his best on that day. So he just lost the debate. He, he, he couldn't answer all the questions. And this man just, just went out, walked out. Uh, at one point, at least occasionally, this was the situation of Muslims. Now look at the situation now. If you say anything that is only slightly different from what the crowd are thinking, you are kafir. I don't think that is a correct attitude. Hmm. Uh, just wanted to follow up. I think uh, Brother Fassi had two other comments uh, to clarify his question. I think you already answered uh, most of it, but, but he's asking there's two approaches. Uh, in the context of that ayah, there's two approaches one can take. Do one's own research or take advice from people like you who have already done this. So, so the question is, should we always try to go to the original source ourselves for better understanding of an ayat or try to reach out to the scholars uh, who have done that? Okay, see, uh, everybody has different um, capacity and abilities. Um, if a person is really not a person of education, uh, he's not really a person of thinking, then he looks at the original sources, he really cannot understand what they actually mean. Such person will go and ask some scholars. Uh, if a person can actually consult the original uh, texts, he will of course go and read the original text, but he will still consult the scholars. What I'm trying to say, Brother Fasi, is that we need to be honest in our research. If we are honest in our research, then we will take every opportunity to learn. If we can, we learn from original sources, we also learn from the scholars. Why we need to choose between the two of them. When I say, for instance, like half an hour ago, I said I, I'm actually researching these days about the concept of zariha. Of course, 
my research is on original texts. I look at the Quran and then I look at Hadith as well. But I also look at the works of scholars because if I don't do that, then I, 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 my research will not be completed. It's not going to be a fully reliable academic research because every human being is, has shortcomings. It is very good probability that I may miss something. When I read what that scholar has said, then I might find out, oh, actually, I never thought about that. So why not doing both of them? But what is important, Brother Fasih, is that you can never say, I have this view because that scholar has it. That's when you have the problem. You need to be convinced about the reasoning of that scholar. Unless, of course, you are talking about illiterate people, which I don't think uh, uh, these are the uh, people that we, are, we have in our circle today. Uh, if, if, they, if they are illiterate people, thank you very much. If, if, if we are, uh, if we have uh, illiterate people, yeah, yeah, you know, you cannot expect them to go and think about the arguments and the logic and think. Of course, they just go and follow somebody. But for people who, like, like, like you, like me, are people of thinking, people of reading books, etc. By all means, go and ask the scholars. And if you can, consult the original texts as well. However, at the end, you need to decide which argument is more convincing. Let me share with you, if I may, uh, some per one personal thing. Uh, I revised my original uh, views uh, a number of times in the last 30 years. And I hope that I have not revealed my age by that. But mm -hmm. uh, I, I have revised my views a number of times. The first time that I revised it, I promised one thing, or well, two things to myself. Uh, I leave one of them because it's not relevant. The second thing that I, I promised to myself was that I will never, ever accept a view of a scholar only because that view comes from such a great scholar. I need to be convinced about it. And I think this should be the way that everybody needs to be. Uh, we should encourage thinking. So again, to answer you, Brother Fasih, in one sentence, consult both sources if you can, scholars and original texts. In fact, uh, if you do that, you can then check the way that scholars are thinking about those texts, and you can double check if they are right or wrong in your view. At the end, you need to decide what is the correct view, which may be the view of one of those scholars, or it might be your own view that might be different from the view of all the other scholars. But, but be cautious as well, okay? So I'm not saying that if your view is different from the view of majority of scholars, uh, there's any problem with that. Of course there's no problem. However, if you happen to develop such a view, just be cautious, you know? Okay, I've developed this view. Uh, my view is different from the view of 80% of scholars. I need to be a bit cautious. Let me do a little bit of more study. Let me discuss my views with some of these scholars just to make sure I'm okay. If you did that and you still were convinced about your views, it is your duty to follow your view and not the view of those majority of the scholars. Thank you, Dr. Rahim. Um, as we sit and listen to you answer these questions, uh, I have my 10-year-old daughter, Rejat, also sitting with me. And she passed a written... What was her name? Rija. R-I-J-J-A. She passed uh, me a written question for you. And I promised I'll ask. I'm sorry if it's too basic. I apologize for that. She wants to know... No she wants to know where is the original Quran? <laughs> ah, mm. I'm a prophet. Muhammad says something. And you call that a basic question? <laughs> That's actually the most difficult question that I have received tonight. Where is the original Quran? Well done, Raja. That, that's a very good question. We'll see, uh, my daughter. Uh, the thing is that uh, Quran uh, originally was not written in a book. Originally, Quran was in the memory of people. Uh, your father can explain for you perhaps uh, in detail that uh, the Quran was in the form of narration. Like, like, like when somebody talks out of his memory. The Quran was in the mind of people, was in the memory of people. 
uh, Rajab, uh, Arab of, of that time, their memory was very good. They have this skill that if you would read like five pages of poetry for them, uh, they would memorize it immediately. They were very good at that. In the same way, people memorized the Quran. Yes, few people also wrote the Quran down, but these were only few. And in the uh, through the history, uh, those were lost. But that is not important at all because the Quran was in the mind, in the brain of people. It was only after, uh, like something like um, 30, 40 years after the Prophet, that people started systematically writing it down. Otherwise, originally, it was in the mind of people, as it is in the mind of many people today as well. And we call them the memorizers of the Quran or Hufad of the Quran, the memorizers of the Quran. Thank you very much. Uh, there is a... Did I answer her question? Yes, she is nodding. <laughs> so, um, the next question I have is from Irshad Sheikh. I have your mic uh, turned on. Please go ahead. Brother Irshad Sheikh. Could you please tell me where is the hell and heaven, either is in the sky or on the earth? Okay. My brother Ashad Sheikh asks, uh, where is hell and heaven? Is it in the sky or is it in the earth? Um, first of all, uh, I always say that a knowledgeable don't know is much better than an ignorant I know. I cannot pretend to know where exactly hell and heaven are, simply because none of us are in that position to know exactly where they are. Uh, but what we can understand from the Quran, and unfortunately the verse is not right now in my uh, in my in my mind, but what we can understand from the Quran is that both of these um, seem to be uh, on the face of Earth. Uh, however, an Earth that is going to be very different from the Earth that we know today. There is a verse in the Quran which, as I said, uh, I, I I I don't memorize that verse, but it is to the effect. Uh, that it says about the day of judgment and it says that the day in which earth will, will change. And what it seems like it means is that a new dimensions start to open. Uh, we are only in three or well, people say four dimensions. Okay? It seems like at the day of judgment new dimensions will come to the earth, right? or Earth will open up itself to these new dimensions and therefore it become very, very vast, very vast and with lots of complexities and multi, multi, multi-dimensional um, um, platform. What exactly that is going to be, we cannot say, but it seems like heaven and hell will then be on that place. So I think we can say, based on the Quran, we may be able to say it is on the face of Earth, but not Earth as we know it today. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Shokeb, you have any other questions? I guess I see another raised hand here. Okay, otherwise I'll, I'll go with the uh, chat questions here. Uh, this question is again from uh, Brother Abdul Rahim Sayyid, and he it's a it's a it's a follow-up question to what you had said. Uh, it goes something like this: counter question. When we say the ruling can be revised if the reason behind it is not applicable anymore, then are we saying Sharia is not permanent and can be changed? I'm just trying to think how I can answer that in a way that I will not create any misunderstanding. Um, 
and I'm also trying to think how can I how can I answer that uh, in a way that I can make it clear what is my personal view and what is the view of my respected teacher because I don't want to uh, attribute something that uh, that is just my own view, humble view, and then people think that it is what Mr. Ramos is saying. Um, I think the way that we should think. Um, let me give you an example. Okay, let me give you an example. Um, so, for instance, we know that uh, when the husband uh, divorces the wife, announces the divorce, then the wife needs to uh, observe edda, which means a waiting period. Only after the finishing completion of the waiting period, if the husband does not come back to the wife, then the wife is divorced. The reason for this idea we know is to establish whether the woman is pregnant or not, whether the wife is pregnant or not. That is the reason, uh, because we know that for the woman that is not hoping for pregnancy, then that idea is not relevant. Now, if somebody today can argue, now I'm not a medical person, okay, so I'm just assuming. If somebody today can argue that, look. We have this um, um, medical test, which is almost 100% correct, definitely is more reliable than just waiting for the at that time in order to understand whether the woman is pregnant or not. So we can actually do this test and establish with almost 100% reliability whether the person is pregnant or not. If that is the case, then there is no there is no reason to keep it there. Now some people say, well, it is good to keep it there because then the husband may revise. Yeah, okay, that's good, but that's not the reason that it there is there. Okay, you, we may say that you know it's advisable that you, that you keep it there, but based on the principle for which the it there is being uh, established, there is no reason for that. Okay. So then my question would be from you, brother, in that case, are we saying then that, that Sharia is forever or is it not forever? Now, if you elaborate on that, then what you will find, actually, is that the principle of that Sharia is forever, which is we need to establish whether a divorced woman is pregnant or not before finalizing the divorce. That is forever. Nobody can question that. Nothing can change that. However, in what way do we establish that? At some time in the past, there was no other way but just waiting to see whether the woman uh, shows the signs of pregnancy or not. Today, there might be other ways to very, very reliably establish that. So then the form will become different. So my view, rather, uh, is that uh, the hekma and the principles behind Sharia, these are forever. The form of Sharia may need to be revised if the situation is changing. Uh, yeah, I think I, I stop here. If there's any follow-up question, I will answer. Uh if, if there is follow-up question, uh, we will read it out to you. I have a question uh, from Muhammad Khan. Uh, your mic is open. Please go ahead. Um, basically, I've written the question as well. Um, it states, uh, I was watching uh, Sheikh Ramadi's program today on uh, the television. He said uh, that um, heaven and hell have not come into existence yet. Can you please um, add some light on that comment and uh, give us some proof from uh, the Quran and the Sunnah, please? Thank you. Wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Heaven and hell has not come to existence. Um, this is because uh, heaven and hell are actually reward and punishment uh, that are going to be given to the people who deserve it, and those people will only start to get that reward and punishment when it comes to the Day of Judgment. Uh, God does not need to prepare these things and arrange them and make them ready for them to arrive. You know, 
once God intends for them to, to, to be created, he will create them. Um, I seem to remember the verses of the Quran that says uh, at that day, you know, God will open up the hell, which then uh, gives the impression that it will actually ignite at that day and it will start uh, the fire, etc. Uh, so the question, brother, should be from the other way around, meaning uh, logically you would not expect for hell and heaven to exist just now when they are only needed at the day of judgment. If somebody argues that no, actually we do have hell and heaven just now, then you should ask that person, can you bring me some evidence? Uh, because logically there is no need for that. To give you a very uh, simple example, uh, if somebody's uh, graduation is in four years time, uh, I will not uh, prepare the ceremony for him just now. I will leave it for a day. I, I will deliver it and I will prepare it and deliver it at the same day or a day before that. Uh, God creates everything just like this. So why does he need to create hell and heaven uh, just now? Uh, so that is my answer. My answer is that you need to ask those people who have different argument to bring their reason. Okay. Okay. Um, can I ask one more question, please? Please go ahead. Okay. Um, my my second question is, um, according to um, Sheikh Ramadi, the the the, sura, the verse in the Surah Baqarah, it says that um, um, the people who have basically um, come to Iman and uh, the Jews as well, the Nasara and the Sabaeen, um, and uh, I know that you, 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 you know this verse very well, um, they, they need to do uh, three things basically. Uh, one is Iman, uh, which is Iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, second one is good deeds. And the third one is um, uh, the Iman on uh, Yawm al-Akhara. So if, 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 if these are the three qualities in people, they will, uh, they will have reward um, on the Day of Judgment, inshallah. I mean, my, my question is, um, bringing Iman to Allah um, is basically proven from the verse of, I think so, which is, I think, uh, is, I'm, I'm not a scholar, so I just think that it's, it's, it comes from uh, um, the, the ayah from Surah Araf, I think, uh, which says, Alastu uh, bi where basically God is uh, taking an oath from the uh, the bani no insan and uh, the, the the third one uh, for the good deeds uh, god says that for alhamaha fuduraha wa taqwaha i want to know that where is the verse in quran on the basis of which uh, allah is basically uh, holding us responsible to bring iman on the yawm al akhirah brother do you have quran in front of you brother i can open uh, it up inshallah that's no problem Okay, please look at verse 62 of Surah Al-Baqarah. So chapter 2, verse 62. Look at that and inshallah you will find your answer there. That is only one verse. Of course there are others as well. Okay, but this is the, this is the verse in which Allah tells us that if you have the Iman in, uh, in Yawm al which is one of the conditions, then you will have reward um, in the day of, on the day of judgment. Then, uh -huh. I, uh, I mean, these are the three conditions which are mentioned in this verse. Now, um, the first condition which says about the iman. For that, we have the proof in Quran where God takes oath from uh, uh, the insan, yeah, which, which says, Allah who is your uh, Lord, yeah. So that is basically, and, and in the verse down, uh, if you go down more into the verse, God says that we will we will use this as an argument against them on the day of judgment. And Ramadi Sahab says that, um, you know, doing good deeds and basically uh, to know that, that falsehood is not good, uh, it's it's basically um, built in into me. Uh, and the proof of that is the ayah for alhamaha fuzuraha wa taqwaha. I want to know that bringing Iman uh, and believing that there will be a day of judgment, where does that come from and, okay. and how, how, how should I believe in that? Okay, I now understand. Why what, should I believe in that? 
Yeah, I understand what you're saying. Uh, okay, uh, th th there, are, there are two things. Uh, there, are, there are two things, brother. Um, why you should th why you should believe in that? You should believe in that on the basis of uh, two categories of reason. The first category is the rational category. The second category is uh, is narrative category. Mm -hmm. The rational category is that if you believe see, believing in God means mm -hmm. believing in God with all the attributes that He has, and we do know what these attributes are. And one of these attributes is that He is Hakim, mm -hmm. He is wise, He is mm -hmm. He is Adil. He does not allow any oppression to happen to anybody. Okay? Yes. If we believe in that concept, then if we think that the life is as we are seeing it today, and when I die, that's it. I will be perished, and there's nothing after that. I'm actually questioning these attributes. Where is wisdom here? Where is justice here? So believing in God, extension of that, will be believing in the Day of Judgment. It is very much like, for instance, um, I'm trying to give, think of a good example here. Um, if, uh, it, it's, it's, it's like saying that uh, you, need to, you need to believe in, uh, in this teacher, and you need to believe that, you need to believe the exam at the end as well, okay? And you know that if the teacher is good, then there needs to be an exam after that. If the teacher just teaches things and that's it, then it's not a good education, right? Maybe it's not a very good example. I just thought it out of the top of my head. So that is the rational category. The narrative category is actually the Quran. Why the Quran has been revealed? For the same reason. So we read the Quran, the Quran says there is the of judgment. Almost every page of the Quran, when you open it, you find a reference to the day of judgment. So, um, if we believe in God, then we believe in His Word, and therefore we believe in the, the Day of Judgment as well. So these are two different categories of, of reasoning that we have. 